Kia ora koutou, ko Tiffany Taku Ingoa, he kairuruku tau whainga aho ki Manaki Whenua. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Tiffany and I am the Events Coordinator at Manaki Whenua Landcare Research. Before I hand over to Hugh, I'm going to run through a couple of technical slides to ensure that your experience with us online today goes as smooth as possible. If you have joined us previously for a webinar session, you can ignore me for the next minute. You will notice you have a control panel at the side of your screen. If at any time this collapses, you can bring it back by simply clicking the orange arrow button. If you are having sound issues and you can see my mouth moving but cannot hear a word I'm saying, please grab the PDF in the handout section and this has instructions to resolve this quickly. The audio panel is where you can control where the sound plays on your computer. Select the drop down arrow and choose your audio output. During the presentation, you may have questions that you want to be covered in our Q&A session. You can do this via the chat panel throughout our session today. You will notice it is pretty small and it will be hard to read other attendees' questions. Select the pop-out icon on this panel and drag the corner out to make it as big as you want. You can also use this feature if you are having technical issues and ask me any questions. Questions asked by the audience show as anonymous and a green colour in the chat panel. However, please note we will use your name in the Q&A session. If I respond to you regarding a question, this will show as read. Now over to Hugh to introduce you to our sixth session for the Biosecurity Bonanza series. Kia ora koutou everybody and uh, thank you Tiffany for that. Um, yes, uh, yet another um, uh, presentation in our Biosecurity Bonanza webinar series. <clears throat> and it's, um, we're on to a topic which is rather dear to my heart. I was involved in getting the original project funded and then along with an amazing group of farmers and huge support from the MPI, we imported, mass reared and released several species of dung beetle into New Zealand. And it's so great to see that this work is still happening and the dung beetle innovations team are still importing, mass rearing and releasing beetles into New Zealand. Um, I now want to introduce Simon Fowler, one of our senior scientists at Manaki Whenua Landcare Research. Simon is a research leader and a senior manager here at Lincoln and has over 30 years experience in biological control. His recent work has been about dung beetles and here he is uh, to tell us all about them. Take it away Simon. Okay, thanks Hugh. Um, I think, think you've given a little bit of my talk all, already there. Um, but anyway, yes, I'm um, I'm a, a sci scientist, a researcher at Landcare Research. Um, I've been interested in dung beetles actually since I was about six. Um, but my recent interests started when I got involved in in the application to release a further 11 species in New Zealand in 2010. Um, and uh, so. And since that, I've uh, since then I've got quite closely involved in in the active research programs here, and gradually seem to be moving from weed biocontrol, my normal comfort zone, in, in into dung beetles. So um, let's just start this presentation. It should uh, all go ahead now. I think it's all about how how we're going to roll out dung beetles in in New Zealand. Um, I'm, I'm presenting it, but it's really jointly written with information of Andrew Barber and Sean Forgey. Um, and I'm going to talk about, first of all, um, dung beetles, obviously. They're the, a bit of background to them, these, these gorgeous creatures, and the current situation in, in New Zealand. I'm going to move over to the pioneers of dung beetles, of in, introducing them anyway, which um, are the guys across the Tasman. Um, I'm going to talk about their pioneering program and, and also their more recent programs. But of course, mostly I'm going to talk about what New Zealand's been doing and particularly our involvement in the recent Australian program. And then I'm going to summarise and just say a few things about where we might go now. So some dung beetle basics. Um, obviously, they love dung. Um, they've evolved to feed on dung and they breed in dung. Dung is their thing. There's an awful lot of them worldwide, um, around 7,000 species, and in, increasing all the time as more are, are discovered. They're the family Scarabidae, which of course gives them the name the scarabs, which you might be familiar with. 
Um, the Egyptians were certainly familiar with it. Um, they they reckoned that that Kepri rolled the sun up the horizon ev every morning. So it was obviously pretty important. They're probably the best studied group of beetles of all the beetles, which is saying quite a lot. And they bury fresh dung in pastures and they provide, a, well, they, they provide us with a, a lot of benefits by doing that. And significant to this talk, obviously, covered a couple of times already so far, is the fact that we got permission to release 11 new species in New Zealand in 2011. So this is a cross section through a dung pattern, a bit of soil of what a well colonized dung pat would look like. You have the rollers, um, which of course are what most people think of as, as dung beetles. And unfortunately, we're not going to introduce any of those and we haven't introduced any and don't intend to. You've got the dwellers, which spend all their time in the dung pat and really they're pretty uninteresting for us too. The ones we are interested in are the things that build tunnels down and they bury the dung. And it can go down to around a meter but usually a, a fair bit less than that. So why are we interested in only tunnelers in, in New Zealand? Well, for a start with, they're by far the most abundant of the, uh, the functional groups. And we figure they're the least exposed to predation. If you're rolling a dung ball away from a pat, then you could get eaten. If you're burying it below, you're, you're much, much less likely to. Of course, dung beetles, are already in, in New Zealand, and I'm going to start by, by pointing out some of our endemic species. As you might expect, if you know anything about entomology in New Zealand, these are really weird. There's so 15 species, they're mostly small, and the first weird thing about them is they're flightless. And here's a few of them. Um, they're actually often really abundant, and they no doubt play an important role in ecosystem services in our native forest, um, de decomposing dung, carcasses, etc. So they're not dung specialists. The other thing is they're very rarely found in pasture, so they really play no particular role in breaking down dung in our pasture systems. And therefore, from this point on, although they're fascinating creatures, they're of no further interest to us. We already do have some exotic pasture dwelling dung beetles though, um, and these can be reasonably common from time to time. We have several self-introduced things that live inside the dung, these little tiny beetles, aphodias and so on, not very interesting, don't read, they, they don't bury the dung. We have two self-introduced Australians. These really prefer marsupial dung. They're quite small and they're never particularly abundant and they don't bury very deep. So really, um, uh, as Australians go, these two are particularly useless. We do have a Mexican though, who's pretty handy. He's a lot bigger. Um, he was introduced way back in the 50s, uh, but he's subtropical. So he's only really good for warm areas. There's only one species, so it only covers part of the year. So, we concluded a while back that we need lots more dung beetles to, to bury dung. So these are the species, seven species currently being reared in New Zealand uh, by Dung Beetle Innovations. And Dung Beetle Innovations, which is a commercial company, um, is bringing in a further four species. The reason we need lots of species and really um, 11 here is not really enough by any means, almost certainly, is that we need different species for different climates, for different soil types. Um, different species prefer different seasons, or prefer they restrict it to different seasons, and even times of day, some, some fly in the daytime, some in the evening, some in the morning, some at night, and not surprisingly, they prefer different types of dung. Um, some are fairly generalist, others are, 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 are much more specific. So just moving on to the Australian dung beetle program. Well, we have to admit here that, that Australia were the pioneers here. Uh, between 65 and 85, they started the whole business of introducing dung beetles, really based around the sort of genius of this guy, George, um, who ended up 
running a program they established 23 species they tried to establish a lot more but they didn't didn't all succeed by a long way and here's a a, a great old photo of George doing some uh, some safari work in Sa South Africa um, obviously a guy there with a big gun in case they in case something tries to eat them so completely different from here since then though since the mid 80s there have been some smaller developments in Australia but and and if anybody wants to find out about those they they can access that that website um, that's the uh, dung beetle ecosystems e ecosystem en engineers website which is their modern program i'm going to talk about more um, and so so this program started in 2018 it's running till 2022 um, typically for australian research it's a big whiz bang program with lots lot, lots of money australian dollars 25 million pretty big by new new zealand standards Uh, sorry, Landcare, I'm going to have to roll in a new logo here. Um, the aims of this, this Australian program are basically to look all across southern Australia, pretty big task, and find out what geographic and seasonal gaps there are in their current dung beetles there. They've got pretty good dung beetles in the north of Australia, but uh, they've got big gaps in the south. They're going to do a lot of rearing and releases of both existing and new species they're importing. And they're going to try to quantify their e ecosystem services provided by these dung beetles. And significantly, they're trying to quantify them economically. There's a big emphasis on extension, um, training, in, in, information flow, etc. And again, they, you, you can find out a, a lot more at, at that website. Just some acknowledgements to the Australian sponsors. It's all organised through Meat and Livestock Australia. There's federal government money feeding in. There's three universities in Australia heavily involved and a, a considerable number of stakeholder groups. Now, the significance to us is that, that Monarchy Annual Land Care Research is a partner and a cash contributor um, and a, a cash um, cat cash beneficiary, I, I might add, to this program. And this all came about because there are two key areas where the Australian program basically wanted New Zealand dung beetle expertise. The first is that we've done a lot of experiments looking at the effect of dung beetles on, on leaching of potential pollutants through soil cores. And we've also looked in considerable detail at the issues of how dung beetles might affect gastrointestinal nematodes, parasites of stock. Um, as part of this program, we've also added four New Zealand field sites to the larger South Australian survey. And we're also following Australian developed protocols. We're doing a lot of cage experiments, a um, bit of scientific jargon there. They're often called me mesocosms. Um, and again, they, these are to look at, to try to quantify the ecosystem services, particularly in dollar terms. And I'm going to just expand on these four topics, the, the leachate studies, the nematodes, the field sites, and the cage experiments in, in the remainder of this talk. So the leachate studies. Um, the question here is, is, do the fact that dung beetles are, are, are putting the, the the, the cattle dung, the sheep dung, etc., deeper into the soil, could that increase the contaminants flowing out of the leachate up in the soil after it rains? And here you can see some photographs in, installing ly lysimeters. Again, a, another bit of scientific jargon. In this case, it's just a large plastic tube, basically, that's, um, that's inserted over the top of a carved out intact soil core. You can see the guys carving them there. Um, so the soil cores in case, the edge sealed, and you can then collect that and either deal with it in situ or as here, you can, you can take it and install it in a facility surrounded in soil, and then you can use these flaps to get access to the, to the, to, to, to the leachate um, collecting 
kit un, un, underneath. So, so when it rains on top, the, the leachate comes through, and you know you you're, you you've got the potential to do, to do some experiments. The basic treatment is you apply dung alone to the top there, or you apply dung plus beetles, and obviously you have controls as well. And the aim in the current work is to cover several soil types, both over here and, and also in Australia, using these, these lysimeters. Um, the, we've already done a few trials prior to the Australian program. Um, and for example, we, we've done trials with an allophanic soil in, from, 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 the, from the Waikato, and we showed no increase in, in nitrogen, phosphorus, or E. coli in the leachate um, after dung beetles have been bearing dung, which is great. Uh, but we do need to cover more soil types. Okay, moving on to gastrointestinal nematodes. I'm just going to give you a very basic life history of these. Um, the eggs of the nematodes uh, are found in fresh dung coming out of stock. And a uh, very scientific term here, there can be lots and lots of them. Um, and I really mean lots. The first and second stage larvae of the nematodes feed on bacteria, etc., in the dung. And then the third stage larvae is non-feeding. It's very active, can migrate onto the foliage and the pasture, and it's the infective stage. Under warm conditions, egg to third stage larvae can take only seven days. The third stage larvae can live for up, up to 12 weeks or so, possibly more, on, on the foliage just waiting to be eaten by stock. So the key question is what affects the numbers going through this life cycle? And how can that in turn be affected by dung beetle activity? And I'm gonna look at two types of dung beetle activity. The first is disturbance of the dung on the surface. And this could be by adults that aren't ready to reproduce. So they're not ready to lay eggs and bury dung yet. And then there's the dung burial process and the, the making of the brood balls by the adults because they, they, they manipulate the dung, they, they chew it all up and suck it. You, you, know, you really don't want to be born again as a, as a dung beetle, I can tell you. Um, so what effect does that have on, on nematodes? And I apologize, this is a little bit complex, but what I've tried to do is, yeah, on the top here, I'm deciding it, I'm dividing it up into dung disturbance and dung burial and creation of brood balls. Down the side is that potted life history. So it's the eggs of the nematodes, survival of the first two feeding stages, and then what's going on with the infective stage. So for example, dung disturbance here, well, actually nematode eggs require um, aerobic conditions. Oh, oh, oxygen to hatch. So actually, dung beetle activity can greatly increase the, the hatch rate, the successful hatch rate of the eggs, which of course then can greatly increase the, the numbers of L1s and L2s in the dung. But if that dung disturbance causes the dung to dry out, then that greatly reduces the survival of the L1s and L2s, which are, are very susceptible to drying out. However, those that get through to be L3s, these are, these are resistant to drying out. And as I said previously, they can migrate onto foliage as long as the conditions are moist enough. They need a, a film of moisture. So there's some ups and downs in that little, uh, uh, that little column. So, so potential complications there. So what about dung burial and brood balls? Well, again, dung burial, by making a brood ball, you're almost certain, or by burying dung, you're almost certain to make the dung more aerobic, so you get more eggs hatching. Um, but the processing into dung balls does appear to destroy most of the eggs. Burial itself, of course, could increase the survival of the L1s and L2s, which otherwise can desiccate if the dung dries out, because the 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 the, the burrows they're going into are going to make sure the dung doesn't dry out. But the processing of dung balls, again, just like it does for the eggs, is likely to kill the L1 and L2 larvae. So the next question is, can the L3s migrate from buried dung? And the answer is yes, uh, particularly if that's relatively shallow, 10 centimeters or less. But this depends on moisture. They can only go through moisture films and soil type. 
Um, they can migrate further in, in sandy soils. Uh, clay soils may be a barrier, um, but sandy soils will seldom have the amount. Anyway, it's, it's complex. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a sim simulation model to try and tackle this complexity. Um, but I might add that the existing data suggests that dung beetles are usually highly beneficial, um, but there are gaps and uncertainties in the data with, with regard to gastrointestinal nematodes. Eventually, what we'd like to do in this Australian program is develop a decision-making tool which farmers can use to basically make the decision, do they drench or not drench? Okay, moving on to those field surveys. We've got four, four New Zealand sites, one intensive, that's the, uh, the, the black dot there, and three lower intensity sampling sites. We're gonna do pitfall trapping and dung removal experiments at all the sites. The intensive site, we're gonna do more detailed research on the ecosystem services with those cage experiments I mentioned before. We've got established dung beetles, several species at three of the sites, but none at the Mahia Peninsula site. And that's a deliberate choice because we wanna see how quickly we can get things introduced. So we've been mass releasing at this site. Last summer, we, we released 20,000 beetles. And just an aside, um, you know, I reckon Rocket Lab ought to be quite impressed of that, uh, that, that, that big boost to numbers. And the reason for this is, of course, that Mahia Peninsula is not, not only now going to be famous for its dung beetles, but of course, it's also famous for firing off rockets. Um, so they get fired off there right on the end, and uh, not all that far away, there's now a lot of dung beetles. Anyway, I thought I'd show that slide just because it's a what a cracking coastline we have. So moving on to cage experiments to quantify ecosystem services. Here's our intensive site, study site at Aotearoa. Um, remember that there are, are, there are similar Australian sites, although they tend to be brown, not green, as our Australian colleagues have pointed out. Um, uh, but they'll be doing the same sort of experiments. The experimental design is a, a long row of cages like that. Um, and essentially, we're adding beetles and or dung at naught and six months. There's 10 reps per treatment. And we're gonna be, gonna be measuring dung removal, how fast it disappears off the surface, what happens to the soil nutrient levels, um, and also pasture productivity. So all these things that we, we think dung beetles have had the potential to have a good effect on. So just as a summary and where we're going now, we think New Zealand pastures need dung beetles and we need to catch up with Australia. Um, as part of that, we've had the good fortune to be able to join the latest Australian dung, dung beetle project. So we're doing parallel research on the, on the impact of beetles but slightly different from Australia, we're also doing these mass releases. We always intended that joining this, this dung beetle ecosystem engineering and engineers project and all the other research efforts, got to acknowledge that there's other research going on at, at Waikato, Otago, that we would use those to springboard further New Zealand developments with dung beetles. And one of those just went in recently last week. We, we put an application into the into the MPI Freshwater, Freshwater Mitigation Fund to see if we can quantify dung beetle benefits to water quality um, by, by, by reducing pollution. Um, and what that would aim to do eventually is to build dung beetles into, into farm management models like o Overseer, again, with real dollar values to farmers to give them proper incentives to get involved. So just the final points. We want to catch up fast. Um, Australia did a lot of its dung beetle introductions in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but really um, has only um, has messed around since then, frankly, um, and a lot of areas haven't got benefits. Hence, they're now, now they're investing big time. We'd rather get going a lot faster. We think the key issues are we've got to show dollar benefits to farmers to get their buy-in, literally. They've got to put their hands in their pockets. 
but we still think that we're likely to need some initial local and, and national government in, incentives to kick all this off fast. I found this modern take on Kepri, um, and I wonder whether this ought to be the new New Zealand model. Um, and there's a, uh, there's a lot of people involved in, in all this, obviously not just me and, Anne, and Andrew and Sean. Um, and with that, I'd just like to say thanks. Wonderful, Simon, thank you very much. Um, so there are a few questions. Um, the first question, um, Edgar, uh, the question that you've asked is something which is more appropriate to ask Sean or um, Andrew about, not Simon and the research area. So the next question here uh, from Sarah is, how did the self-introduced species get here, Simon? <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. Um, <laughs> uh, the, these things are, are quite capable of flight, so some of them could, could get here flying. Um, I suspect yeah, most of them probably came as, as adults, um, and I guess live animals were brought out here. There would have been they would have been producing dung. Yeah, um, all speculation really. Um, certainly not deliberately brought out by any uh, climatization societies. Anyway. All right. <clears throat> Next question from uh, Sharon Price. Rumor has it dung beetles are killed by macrocyclic lactones in. Oh, hang on, sorry, in dung from treated stock. Is this true or a myth? Um, I, I just lost the first part of that, Hugh. You better repeat oh, it. Sorry about that. Um, rumor has it that dung beetles are killed by macrocyclic lactones in dung from treated stock. Is this true or not? Um, yes, uh, but, um, which is a great scientist aren't answer isn't it um <laughs> uh yeah yes i mean the evidence isn't all that brilliant has to be said um and for example we have we 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 know of farmers in new zealand who are very keen on on drenches but still have high population densities of dung beetles one of the reasons for this is that um is the whole drenching regime that farmers use tends, tends to be quite complicated. For example, they will drench their young cattle, um, but not the older cattle. So there's nearly always um, drench-free dung available. Sheep, they drench a bit more, um, but again, there's, as long as there's drench-free dung available, then you won't kill all your dung beetles, um, and not all drenches by any means kill kill dung beetles. Um, the mac mac macrocyclic lactones are supposed to be bad, um, but really, to be absolutely honest, um, a close scientific scrutiny of that work hasn't been done all that well. And it is actually part of the, of the Australian project at the moment to, to look into that more closely. Excellent, thank you. Um, next question from Liam Bancroft. Are there specific dung beetles for specific livestock or are dung beetles purely chosen for soil types? Um, <laughs> both is the answer. Um, I, I'm not sure that there, there, there really aren't any specific dung beetles that absolutely go for single dung types, but they certainly have preferences. Um, you know, so 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 there are even dung beetles in in Europe that prefer the uh, that prefer sheep dung that I guess is already made into balls, so they can roll the things away really easily. Um, uh, and certainly, we've chosen dung beetles that go for large herbivore dung um, because we because because that that's the target. Um, uh, but they're chosen for soil types as well. So so they're both they're both both significant that they're both significant fact factors in in dung beetle choice here yeah. cool uh next question from tony robinson are the beet uh are the beetles which have been released in new zealand doing their work already yes they are it's very patchy though um there, there are very few sites that have 
more than say two dung beetles established. There are some sites that have up to four, um, but you're really talking a handful of sites. So it's very early. It's been considerably faster in the north than in the south, and that's just climate. Um, so, so you can go to some sites. I mean, our, our, our intensive site, Otrahongo, uh, uh, was partly chosen because it's got good activity of two species, and some more species have now been released. Um, and by good activity, I mean that you'd probably see about 60 or 70 percent of dung pats at any one time have had extensive dung beetle activity. So they've been, they've had a lot of dung buried. Cool. Uh, next one from Eva Biggs. Do you know what is the effect of antibiotics used in animal farming on dung beetle activity? Well, again, the answer is really the same for drenches, except we know even less. Um, so just more, yeah. Um, there has been um, there has, has been some very recent research published in the last few months, I think, which looked at the the sort of gut biota of dung beetles exposed or not exposed to antibiotics. And obviously it's different, um, but they weren't terminal. Uh, so, so it changes things. So yeah, I think, I think um, if anybody wants to get money and do a PhD on that, it'd be great. <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, next question from uh, Lizzie Green. Do dung beetles carry any diseases themselves or any that we should be weary of? Well, yes, they can carry diseases. Um, that's one of the reasons that we're so careful in our process of bringing them into quarantine. Um, we don't bring them in very often. I mean, when a new species comes in, it's quite a big thing. Um, they come in, their eggs are surface sterilized, um, and then so, so, so a great deal of care is is um in, ensures that they're not bring, bringing anything in um so so uh, so so yes um that they, they certainly ca could be carrying things um and we we make sure that that risk is reduced to a a, a minuscule risk yeah we certainly have having done this myself for uh, early importations of them we have experts that um and diseases that help us to uh, ensure that we um in part of the process of surface sterilizing eggs and rearing these things before release to ensure that they don't carry diseases when we remove them from our containment ready for release right next question from jenny mcgimpsey what work is happening in the south island well there have been quite a few releases in the south island um uh in general there hasn't been a lot of monitoring of what's going on it's a lot slower in the south island because you get less less generations per year um but yeah we well we need more done the, the, but there are a lot of releases done um dome beetle innovations were only telling me just the other day that a farmer in canterbury had released 20,000 dung beetles on his farm, I think, which is something like four times the normal amount released. So, so things are happening, um, but it, it, yeah, in colder climates, it's not that quick, um, but we do have dung beetles that will do okay in those climates. We did make some initial releases of quite large numbers down in Southland, but um, mm. I don't think we've had much in the way of good results from down there, I'm not sure. Um, next question from Nikki Carter. Noting that there may be some positives to come out of dung beetle introductions, uh, why is it considered that New Zealand needs these? Is it primarily to reduce water pollution due to runoff or other things? Well, I suppose it starts with the, it start, I mean, the basic point of dung beetles, the first thing is to get dung off the surface into the soil. Um, that, that means that if there is 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 sur surface runoff, then it's going to contain less less pollutants, less nu nutrients. You get the dung into the soil, and then you've made those available for plant growth. The process of 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 burying them tends to lead to long term improvements in the in soil quality, um, and then lead to greater in infiltration of of water. Um, 
uh, and then there are associated benefits from um, if, for, for both animal and human health for having less dung on the surface. So less dung for flies to be attracted to and, and, and so on. So, so, I mean, they're not a silver bullet for any one thing, but they just help in you know, a wide range of, of, of what we call e ecosystem services. And basically dung beetles are, I mean, when it comes to nu nutrients, we're, we're basically for the first time, I think, establishing a proper nitrogen cycle in the soil. True. Okay, next question from Murray Cave. Are you going back to prior, prior release areas and doing a detailed assessment of the benefits of beetles and any cost benefit analysis? Well, um, as, as part of the, well, of course, the first thing to say is that all these things cost money. Um, but uh, as part of the part of the application we just put into MPI, we will be going back to the the release sites across the country to assess what what beetle populations are there. Um, in terms of cost benefit analysis, we certainly wouldn't be doing that at every farm, but um, but applying um, some sort of cost benefit analysis would be an obvious thing to do once we've got those those dollar benefits from from the ecosystem service experiments that we're currently planning. And, and there have been some dollar benefits applied in countries like in in countries like England and, and Wales in, in the UK. Um, but they're fairly high level studies. They don't really drill down to to what's going on in, in a given bit of pasture. All right, uh, next question, Morgan Merrion. How do you choose which species of dung beetles to introduce to New Zealand and which traits do you look for? Right, well, they were basically, again, this is something that Sean Forgey could answer better than myself. Um, uh, but, but, but basically, probably the very first trait is climate match. I mean, there's absolutely no point in introducing a a, a tropical specialist beetle in, in New Zealand because it's just not going to succeed. So there has to be a reasonable mat, match of climate, otherwise you, you're wasting your time. Um, but, but the next one would be that they have to be a, a reasonably specialist on large herbivore dung um, because we... Uh oh ...be specialist for open pasture. Um, and and then really soil type would probably be a a subsidiary one after that. Um, we we want to have a range of beetles that go for sandy soils, clay soils. Um, um, so 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 really that's the that's the right. Um, there there is a nice um, there's a nice report. Well, it would be a nice report because it's got my my name on, of course. Um, which we we produced for um, for Gisborne District Council, which goes into that, and that is that is publicly available. Um, uh, he says, um, I suppose we can sort of do a little bit of uh, promotion here, can't can't can't, can't we? So um, you don't have too many minutes, Simon. But yes, <laughs> no, no. There there we go. So if you do a search for that on the web, then. Um, that that has a sec section that covers that question in more thoroughly than I can here. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next question, we've just got two more. So um, Lisa Caswell, how do you measure their potential negative effect on local soil dynamics and native invertebrates? Right, well, I suppose the first thing to say is that, um, I mean, there will be some effects on soil dynamics and and invertebrates. The fact though that we're choosing dung beetles that like uh, open pasture and large herbivores means that we're dealing with essentially exotic systems here. Um, so yeah, um, the, 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 we, we, we specifically chose or avoided dung beetles that would go into bush, for example, because then they have the potential to interact with our own, our own dung beetles and we don't want that. Um, there will be some occasions where some of our indigenous invertebrates are present in 
exotic pastures here, um, and there will be some interactions there. Um, but generally speaking, those those exotic invertebrates will, will be found elsewhere as well. Um, so we didn't rate those those interactions as particularly important. Um, there will be some other interactions. I mean, we know um, there were concerns raised with interactions with with earthworms. Generally speaking, those tend to be positive, for example. So, so, so interactions specifically with indigenous organisms that are using exotic pastures in New Zealand, some will be positive, some I'm sure will be negative, um, but you've got to kind of look at the bigger picture. Okay. Um, from Reese Boons, could these beetles invade native grasslands? Looks like you've pretty much answered that one. But invade native grasslands and live on deer and lagomorph dung. Um, example, tussock grasslands and change right. how these ecosystems function. Right. Well, the, well, well, that's a very, that's a very, very valid concern, um, and it's one we addressed in 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 the application process. Um, for a start with, um, the beetles we've brought in, we deliberately avoided ones that prefer that 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 prefer rabbit and hair dung. I mean, there are beetles that do that. Um, there's a splendid beetle in southern England called the Minotaur beetle, which is a rabbit dung specialist. Um, fantastic thing, but unfortunately, of course, we therefore it, therefore had to exclude that. Um, they will go for deer dung, um, but but with the current level of deer management. Deer densities are so low; they're about one per square kilometer. The amount of deer dung in those tussock grasslands is is tiny. So any any invading exotic dung beetles that we introduce, their numbers will be tiny as well. Plus the fact many of those are at high, high altitude, and and we that they'll be beyond the altitudinal range of a lot of the species we've got. But if they do get in there, their impacts are going to be very small. So they won't be making any any massive changes to soil uh, nu nu soil nutrient levels in in those environments, and so they won't be threatening native plants, native in invertebrate communities in in those environments. So that's so the answer is yes, we considered it, and no, we don't think it's an issue. Quite right. Excellent, Simon. Thank you very much. And um, that is the last question. Just before we go, there is a comment from Murray Cave saying that it's good to see the work that was done for them in Gisborne has been promoted as well. So thank you for that, Simon and the Dung Beetle Innovations guys. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much for everybody attending. And thank you, Simon. Okay. You're most welcome.